Hi guys and welcome to this week's video. This video is a bit different. Today I'm showing you the way that I record art videos, hopefully to make things appear straightforward so I can encourage you guys to record your art too. I found there to be lots of challenges to overcome at first so I'll explain my solutions and what I think works best on a budget. So first of all I'll show you my setup and then we'll take a look at the settings and OBS recording software and finally Windows Movie Maker. Timestamps will be below in the description box. So let's start by having a quick look at what my desk looks like. Please excuse the video quality in this section, I'm using a phone to record and it isn't the best quality and it is slightly shaky. This is my setup, so I use a Logitech C920 webcam which is plugged straight into one of my computer's USB ports. I chose this camera after seeing many other artist YouTubers using this model and after looking through lots and lots of reviews I came to the conclusion that it's the best affordable webcam on the market. The webcam is mounted on a ball head copy stand which is a monopod tripod sort of thing that has legs that lay flat against the desk. This way I can angle the stand so that the camera is facing directly over the top of my work. Beforehand I just used a small camera tripod to mount the webcam on which worked but it did create an odd angle and perspective as I had the camera tilted towards my work rather than directly overhead. And although it was a small and subtle change I think that this improves the viewing experience quite considerably and it makes it easier for the webcam to focus on the entirety of my work. So when I'm not using my camera to record, I just swing the tripod sort of to the side so that um, it obstructs my screen a little bit less. But of course I could just dismantle the setup if I really needed to see my screen entirely. And here I'm showing that the uh, tripod is very adjustable. I could ex extend the arm out a lot further than it is currently. And I can also adjust the angle of the arm. As for lighting, I use what I have, um, two desk lamps as well as my ceiling light. There's also a window behind me which helps and it, if it's particularly dark I have a light on my alarm clock that I can use as well as an LED strip on the wall next to me. I cover the lamps with baking paper to help diffuse the light a bit and this creates more of a glow rather than a harsh spot of light. It's very convenient, these lamps are bendy and adjustable as it means that I can have them facing any direction that I'd like and I usually have them directed towards um, one of my walls and this helps to diffuse the light even more. The surface that I work on is something else that I already had. It's a large glass tile designed to be mounted on the wall and used for a whiteboard or a magnetic pinboard. I like that it's a non-porous surface which makes it easy to clean when painting. It's a very pale turquoise which helps to brighten up my videos but because it's not just flat white it doesn't compete with uh, white paper. The drawback to this tile is that it's reflective which can sometimes make lighting adjustments a bit difficult. I have the tile sat over the top of my camera stand's legs which helps to hide them but also stops the camera stand from moving around as much. Underneath the tile I have a cheap silicon baking mat to stop the tile from sliding around. This setup works fine when I'm working small, so A5 or 5x7 inches, but because I have to extend the camera pole out quite away in order to capture a larger piece, you can see the edges of my desk in frame on those kind of videos, so eventually I'd like to have something a little bit bigger. I like to mark uh, the positions of my setup with tape or marker so that if the setup moves I don't have the headache of trying to work out where things were to get a good picture. For recording narration I use a headset rather than a built-in microphone in the webcam. I made this change more recently and I found that the clarity of my audio has improved substantially. It's certainly not perfect though and perhaps one day I'll upgrade to a better mic. So the only things that I bought specifically for this setup was the webcam and the stand. The rest I just made to do with what I already owned and I'll leave the US and UK Amazon links to the purchase products in the description box below. Overall I paid something like $80 for these two items and considering I get a fairly high quality 1080p recording from it I think that's fantastic. Probably one of the cheapest good quality and purpose built recording setups you'll get considering the cost of a regular camera. I do recommend looking at the computer system requirements and recommendations for this camera before purchasing it though, and I'll also leave a link to those in the info box down below. 
Another alternative is to use your phone to record videos or narration if you don't have a camera or mic and you could buy a mount for your phone and then attach it to a tripod or monopod and get similar results to what I'm getting here. This is also a good option if your computer doesn't have a good enough processor to handle video encoding via webcam. So to summarise this section of the video, make use of what you have, look around your house and see what you can use. So now I'm going to give a very brief overview of my webcam settings and OBS. First of all, the Logitech webcam comes with a very handy control panel where I can change lots of different video settings which makes getting a clear image really easy. I change the settings depending on how bright the room is and what colour the subject matter is. I vertically flip and mirror the camera settings here and in OBS so that the video is the right way up considering it's opposite um, the webcam is opposite me and looking down over on my work. As for OBS, it's pretty straightforward. You add your inputs under the sources column and then you can edit the properties of the source by either double clicking it or uh, right clicking it and then clicking properties. Here you can change resolution and a bunch of other stuff that I have no idea about. My biggest tip about using OBS for recording is to make sure that your recording output is in MP4. The default setting is FLV, which isn't very useful if you're using Movie Maker to edit. You're also able to stream with OBS, which I'm pretty new to, but it seems to work excellently for that as well. I'll leave a link to where you can download OBS for free in the description box down below. Next up I'm going to quickly show you how I use Windows Movie Maker to edit my videos. Although it's a very simple program, it gets the job done and with a few tips and tricks you can make smooth and fairly professional looking videos with uh, this program. I'll leave a link to where you can download the software in the description box below. And just like OBS, the recording software I use, it's free, which makes recording videos that much more affordable. So I've recorded my footage and have it in this folder. I right click the first clip and select open with Windows Movie Maker. I then select the rest of the video clips. I usually use the shift or control keys to my advantage here and then I drag and drop those clips into Movie Maker as well. I then add my intro and end screens and I also add transition animations to these so that they better slide into the video. I make sure that my end slate is 20 seconds long, which is the maximum length that an end card can be on YouTube. Of course this is completely optional and really is dependent if you're using YouTube as a uh, platform to upload your videos to or not. I also like to add a scan of the completed drawing to the end of speed paint videos so that people can get a clear view of the outcome. Once I have a basic layout of the video, I'll start adding narration to the clips where I haven't recorded audio whilst filming. So to add a narration, I'll first record my lines in OBS, I'll check how they sound, and then I'll click add music. I know, narration isn't music, but hear me out. So when I click on add music, it'll open up the file explorer, and in the bottom right you'll want to select all files, um, so you can see video clips as well. For me, when I record a narration in OBS, it saves as a video clip, but with just a black screen. Once I've got the first narration section in place, I'll have that piece of audio selected, and then once again click add music, and then I can add the rest of the narration in bulk. Um, so this way all of the following narration will slot in nicely after the first one and not overlap and doing it this way requires less repositioning. Now I edit the narration. Usually for me this means splitting up some of the narration clips to add some pauses and breaks in my speech. This just makes it a more pleasant listening experience and makes it sound less like I'm doing the whole video in one breath. I also might edit out ums and other small mistakes I make when talking. I can definitely sink way too many hours into doing this though and often just re-record sections to make things easier. When I edit the clips I like to zoom in using the tool in the bottom right corner of the screen and this makes it easier to see the waveforms as individual lines rather than just sort of one big green clump. If you have a mixture of audio that's recorded as you film, as well as a narration track, it's useful to have waveforms visible on your video clips, and this can be toggled on and off under the view section of the toolbar. And having the waveforms visible on the video makes it so that you can quickly check to see if you have any overlaps in your narration um, that you've added and the narration that's present on your video clips. 
So as I mentioned before, this usually takes quite a while, but now I'm finished, I can move on to the next part. So in this case, the narration is on top of a speed paint, so what I'll do is I'll speed up the video footage so that it fits the length of the narration. You can speed footage up to 64 times in Windows Movie Maker, um, but with this I start off with a rough estimate of how much I think that I need to speed the footage up by, and then I'll increase or decrease the factor until the narration and footage are about the same length. Note that you can type in the factor you want to multiply the footage by, you're not just limited to the presets they give you. Um, you can even give decimal places if you need to be really accurate, like 14.3 uh, or 5.5 times for example. Now I'll add the music, and here I click add narration, yes I know it's backwards, I'll explain in a second. Um, so once I've clicked add narration I'll click add sound and it opens up the file explorer again. So all the music I use comes from YouTube Audio Library and is royalty free, so I'll leave a link to that page in the description. I listened to a bunch of different tracks and downloaded my favourites, I then wrote up a list where I organised these soundtracks into categories so I could easily mix and match to select similar sounding songs when I add music to my videos. Once I've added in my first song, I'll add the others, and I repeat the process where I click on add narration and then add sound, etc. So now I can explain why I add the narration as music and the music as narration. I add music as narration because for some reason you can only add audio clips in one at a time when choosing to add it as add sound. I usually have 3 or 4 songs playing throughout a 10 minute long video, but I might have 20 or 30 different narration clips, and being able to add that narration in bulk is very useful, but it's not difficult to add 4 music tracks separately. So that's why I add them under the wrong categories. So just to quickly recap, if you click add music in Windows Movie Maker, you can bulk add lots of different clips in one go, but if you click add sound, you can only add one at a time. Of course, if you're only adding music to your speed paint videos, then you can use the add music function. Also beware that when adding add sound clips, the next one will overlap the previous. So to fix this, I like to zoom my view in and see where the waveform of the music trails off and then slide the next track over to the end of it, as this function is just a lot easier. Also with music, I really like to have a fade in at the start of the video and a fade out at the end. So to do this, I click the respective tracks at the beginning or end of the video and choose a slow fade in or a slow fade out. It's also really important to make sure that the audio levels of your video are okay. When having narration as the music track, you want to click emphasize music under the project options. It's really worth listening to your project, project and seeing if levels are consistent throughout the video and adjusting each clip individually if necessary. Um, compare the volume of your video to a video on YouTube to make sure that it's not too loud or too quiet. So finally, to finish up, I add captions if I need them, and I try to be consistent with the font I use, and try to pick a style, colour and size that is readable, but not too distracting. And before I click uh, export video, I will go through all the things that I've added to my video clips to make sure that um, they're okay. So for example, I might, I'll make sure that the audio levels are okay for each clip of video and narration and music. Um, I'll check to see if the animations are okay and correct, and the um, timings of them are okay. Same with captions. Exporting a video can take quite a long time, so it's best to try and pick up on these things as soon as you possibly can. I also like to try and watch my video before I export or render it, but sometimes that's not always possible if I've sped it up by more than about four times. Um, those areas will be choppy if they are more than four times um, sped up. So what I'll try and do instead is I'll listen to a few places to check the audio, audio levels in those sections and then I'll just do an overall check um, before exporting again. So to export the movie you click file and then save movie and click for high definition display and that's really important to make sure that the video is um, of a nice quality to be uploaded to YouTube. It also means that the aspect ratio is going to be correct for YouTube. And once it's done exporting, I'll have a quick listen through the entire video to make sure that everything is okay and if there are things that need to be changed, I'll make a note and I'll um, edit those in Windows Movie Maker again, um, and then I'll render it again. 
and then all that's left is dragging and dropping it into YouTube and um, uploading it. So I hope that this video was helpful, be sure to leave me a comment if it was or any questions that you'd like answered. Hit that subscribe button if you'd like to see more tutorials, reviews, challenges and other arty videos. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next week.